All right, Greg doesn't know this, but I'm about to hijack the show. <laughs> <laughs> you all have no idea how hard it is to put a show together, especially when you've got some kind of script that Greg has written. So be prepared because boy, have we got a doozy for you this month. Welcome to Ham Talk. My name is Sam Henley, K-E-0-L-M-Y. This is Greg. Howdy, Greg and 5XO. This is Andrea. Hello, Andrea Kilo 2 Echo Zulu. And of course, you can't see Melissa's beautiful face this month because she's got a little bit of an internet connection problem. So you're either going to see a phone emblem or we're going to try and get Greg to drop some funny pictures or something in. So here's Miss Melissa. <laughs> Hi, everybody. It's Melissa KI5 ICQ. So we're going to talk a little bit about, because this is my part where I get to hijack the show, we're going to talk a little bit about all of the bumps and bruises we're going through to try and bring this information to you guys and bring you something entertaining and fun. Um, we do a lot of struggling sometimes when it comes down to timing and our schedules. A couple of our hosts are, or a couple of our people are in the same state. It's kind of easy for them to get their schedules together. And a couple of us are in other states. So we're, even though we're connected by this great ability and capability through uh, Zoom calls and teleconferencing and things like that, hey, we have communications problems too. And I think that's actually a very important thing to get across when you guys come to watch us is, we're amateurs, okay? We're not trying to tell you guys the best way to do things, but we're giving you a little bit of information on how we've been able to do it. So this is just a small part, you know, Greg is gonna have a fun time putting together all of the blooper reel for this year because he's gonna have a ton <laughs> of just minutes and hours of us trying to figure things out and put out the best that we can for you guys. It's always important to let you see that we struggle to try and give you the best. So I just wanted to hijack the show a little bit and you know take a little little host hijacking there to give you guys a little view <laughs> of what goes on before this camera starts rolling. So first of all, I wanna thank Melissa because she is being super patient with us. Even though she doesn't have internet, doesn't have emails, doesn't have any of these a technology that she actually needs to do this show with us. She is working herself overtime trying to get in and come in as a caller. So we're going to be talking to her a little bit. We're going to talk to Andrea a little bit. And then Greg, of course, has a bazillion things he wants to talk about. <laughs> so we're going to talk to him <laughs> a lot. <laughs> All right. We're going to pick on you this month. You deserve it. <laughs> okay. I can't argue that. It's true. It's true. But the most important thing I think that we're going to actually talk about is something very serious. And it is the fact that Texas, where I believe Melissa and Greg both are, Andrea, are you also? Also in Texas. We're right also now. in Texas. So all three of them are in Texas where you guys just had huge power outages and all sorts of issues and problems with the snowstorm that hit. We're actually going to tackle that subject in this uh, podcast this month. Uh, before we get into that, though, there were a couple of questions, a couple of things that we want to get into. And, you know, this needs to be organic. So while I am going to read you guys the actual question and what's going on, uh, understand that some of it is because I don't deal with the terms a whole lot. And I want to make sure I get it right. And I'm sure Melissa can empathize with me on that because she's brand new to our hobby. So I, I think 100%. That <laughs> All right, so the biggest thing that we keep hearing about is the term BHF weak signal operating. What does it mean? Is it kind of like QRP on HF and why is it growing so popular? So I actually want to ask Greg this. So Greg, can you tell us a little bit about that? Very good question, Samantha, and thank you very much for asking me. Uh, weak signal operating has become kind of a passion for me uh, with uh, it taking over about 80 to 90% of my uh, amateur radio activities. I do very little HF anymore. Uh, weak signal is not QRP. It is a reference to the signal to noise ratio uh, coming in to your radio and uh, everything. In fact, uh, most operators run anywhere from 50 to full legal limit. Uh, just as an example, at my own personal station, on six meters, we do full legal limit, 1500 watts. 
on two meters, I run 1,000 watts, 220, 1,000 watts, 432, 1,000 watts, and on 900, 100 watts, and on 1296, we do 250 watts uh, with the recent uh, amplifier purchase. So, you know, uh, as you can see, it's not low power output. Um, weak signal is basically CW and single sideband operating with the new digital modes such as FT8 and stuff uh, taking their place in the uh, top, this portion of the hobby like they do so many other things. Uh, the big advantage to weak signal is it can work incredible distances compared to say two meter FM. Uh, I know you, uh, you're unhappy a lot of times with the ability to communicate radio to radio in your area uh, because of the hills and uh, rocks and things like that. Uh, so you have a lot of obstructions to your FM signal and you find that the range is dramatically reduced. Uh, if you operated single sideband and the person you were talking to single sideband, you'd see that change from an average of 15 to 20 miles communication with a good FM uh, two meter station to 150 to 200 miles with the exact same station setup. So uh, you have a, a lot of abilities to communicate and I'm gonna do some demonstrating on that. Uh, but first let, let's go ahead and, and describe a little bit. Weak signal VHF UHF can be one of the most exasperating uh, parts of the hobby. It can also be one of the most addictive and rewarding. Uh, I cannot tell you the amount of excitement when you take a band that 90% of people will tell you is good for uh, line of sight, 15, 20, maybe 30 miles, and you talk 500, 700, 1,000 miles, okay? And uh, I have been a big ambassador to Weak Signal operating in this area and have been promoting and encouraging it. And uh, people are taking baby steps and we're slowly growing. And the activity level here in San Antonio and Central Texas has, has pretty much exploded uh, in the last few years, uh, especially since COVID. Uh, it's been a big boom for us uh, because people are home uh, with nothing to do. So they're now experimenting and trying new bands and, and, and uh, modes and everything. So it's, it's a lot of fun. Uh, weak signal operating refers to long distance communication that requires an unusual combination of luck, skill, and equipment uh, on the VHF and up amateur frequencies. When everything clicks, it's possible to span distances of excess of 1400 miles on all the bands up to 23 centimeters. Taking advantage of a phenomenon known as tropospheric ducting, and I'm tongue tied on that, also known as tropo, three to 400 mile contacts are possible. More reliable uh, contacts are made with trophospheric uh, scattering and a good station typical without any ducting or anything as we're gonna demonstrate here in a, just about 10 seconds, uh, can talk on the order of 200 to 300 miles every single day, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Uh, in fact, let's go ahead and step right into the shack and let's do a quick contact. Uh, first thing I'm gonna do is uh, let's pull up a screenshot here. As you look on the screen, you can see right now, we don't have any major conditions. Uh, we're, we're, we're under typical conditions. We've got no inducting advantages between San Antonio and uh, uh, the Corpus Christi Alice area and uh, everything. And uh, we're looking at, uh, let's pull another screenshot up here. Right now we're looking at uh, the pathway to uh, Dale, K-A-5-Y-E-U, uh, who I'm gonna make uh, an attempt to contact here right now. And uh, we're a little over a hundred and, what's it say here? We're looking at about 116, 120 miles from my QTH to his QTH. So uh, let's see what we can do real quick. KA5YEU, KA5YEU, N5XO, uh, Echo Lima 09. N5XO, KA5YEU, Echo Lima 07. Good morning. 
Good morning, Dale. Uh, 169 miles approximately. Uh, and got a good copy on you. You're 5 uh, 8 uh, into uh, San Antonio today. Greg, you're about the same. A 5 and 8 or so. Uh, sounding good this way. Uh, conditions are uh, uh, not enhanced, so this is as it is. Uh, back to you. All right, yeah, no uh, enhancement, and uh, we're running right at about 200 watts to 250 watts right now. Okay, well, let's go ahead and switch over to 146.52 and uh, reproduce this contact on FM. Roger, roger, Greg. I'm 100 watts, and uh, we'll cue it twice. N5YU. N5XO. All right, now we're going to do the same thing uh, on FM, uh, running 100 watts. Uh, about 250 watts as well, and uh, same type of antenna system. KA5YEU, KA5YEU, this is November 5, X-Ray Oscar. Let's open the stores. KA5YEU, KA5YEU, N5XO. Morning, Harold. Stand by. We're trying to do a uh, test here to uh, demonstrate something. Uh, KE5 YEU, KE5 YEU, N5XO. Good morning, Greg. Good morning. Uh, this is uh, Harold Hill, uh, Delta Charlie Charlie, Charlie Charlie. Nothing heard. Uh, we'll try one more time. KE5 YEU, KE5 YEU. KA5YEU, KA5YEU, this is November 5, X Ray Oscar, Echo Lima 09. All right, as you can see, that's not happening. Well, what you saw was we made a clean, quick contact on single sideband, and we had absolutely no problems. That was a distance of about 120 miles, and uh, we, we made a quick contact. And as you saw, I mean, spur of the moment type thing here. Uh, we went over to FM. Now, I want to point out two things. Number one, I deliberately dialed down my power so that I could match my FM station. So I ran 250 watts. I ran the single uh, 15 element uh, Yagi at uh, about 75 feet for my two meter S SB contact. And then when we switched over to FM, I was also running 250 watts off my TE amp, and we were going into actually better antennas. I've got a stack set of 13 element uh, vertical antennas for two meter FM. Uh, so we actually had more antenna gain uh, than uh, what we did on the uh, sideband contact. And as you saw, we weren't able to make contact in any way, shape or form. Both my FM and my single sideband antennas are fed through remote relays at the top of the tower, and uh, both of them are using uh, uh, three quarter inch, seven eighths uh, hard line. So, uh, you know, the losses are, are at an absolute minimum there. All right, let's go ahead and go back to Dale real quick and thank him. KA5YEU in 5XO, you copy here? from you copy well all right i could not get any response at all on fm were you able to hear anything uh the noise level may have uh changed just a little bit but uh nothing for a contact i couldn't even tell if it was you making the uh noise level change uh, uh no copy all right yeah i had the same problem uh even with the squelch wide open i couldn't copy you all right. Hey, Dale, I thank you real quick for uh, taking time out while we're uh, filming the show here to uh, go ahead and help with this demo. Uh, 73 is for right now, and we'll talk to you later on. N5XO in your final.
Okay, now uh, let's go ahead and take a look at a couple other demos. Uh, here, here is a, uh, a couple contacts that I made. This contact is uh, with uh, Byron uh, W5FH in East Texas. He is approximately 213 miles, as you can see from the uh, pathway uh, screenshot here. And uh, let's go ahead and, and check out that video. Yeah, okay. N5XO W5FH in Echo Mike 21, about three miles from Crockett on the northeast side. And I'm look, pretty much looking your way with the antenna. I've got it real close to you. And uh, I'll take a, another listen at the beacon, another listen at the beacon here shortly. But I know I was I was copying uh, copying it right there while you were while I was listening to you the other transmission. N five XO W five F A. Byron is two hundred thirty six miles from here. Okay, this next video is uh, going to be a pretty impressive one. Uh, this is uh, made with a station here in San Antonio, and I'll explain uh, that station in a moment, and a station in Missouri. We're talking almost uh, 575, 580 miles uh, for Tom. Um, I had made the contact with the station in Missouri and then uh, went ahead and informed him that uh, another smaller station was trying to work him and to please uh, open up and listen for him. So Tom began to make the contact and uh, they did make the contact. They had some difficulty. But first, let me explain a little bit about Tom Station uh, to put this in perspective. Uh, Tom Station at the time consisted of a 50 watt radio and a single K5 VH Omni antenna. Uh, you'll see two of them on top of my tall tower back there. Uh, Tom was running a single one and on a tripod about 10 to 12 feet uh, off his balcony. So uh, not much of a, uh, a setup for this contact. So this demonstrates just how much you can do in weak signal VHF, UHF, okay? Now I hear both stations really well. I've got my antennas aimed in the Missouri station. He is making a great contact with me. I've got a good copy on him. Tom is just about six to 10 miles away from me, so I can hear him off the backside of my beam. And uh, they go. So uh, let's go ahead and listen to this contact. Again, keeping in mind, 50 watts, a single omni antenna off of an apartment balcony. Okay. I need you to copy your call. But uh, you have to migrate it. Echo Mike 50, Echo Mike 50, over to you. Uh, so uh, please uh, repeat your call. This is Kilo 5, Yankee Golf, but I QSL the EL09RL. Over. Roger, Roger. I got your Echo Larry. Uh, Echo Larry 50, please copy. Uh, November 5, Golf, India, Tango, N5, GIT, kind of like you're done. Well, that was a fantastic contact. And again, with 50 watts and a single omnidirectional antenna off of an apartment balcony. So don't ever say you can't do it. Uh, Tom showed through uh, hard work that uh, he was going to make the station. And this is when he first got into single sideband. 
and was just starting to build his uh, station up. He's now got a few hundred watts and a little bit more uh, antenna set up. He's still handicapped by the apartment complex, but he's doing a much better job with a uh, small uh, uh, quad uh, beam and uh, 200 plus watts, so uh, he's growing. Now, one thing I'm just gonna quick point out uh, is half of the problem they had making that contact was because Tom didn't follow the rules and use standard phonetics. Had he used standard phonetics, and that's a pet peeve of mine, uh, this would have uh, eliminated half the problems they had on the contact. Uh, when you've got a weak signal and you're really struggling to be heard, the last thing you need to do is, is say uh, wrong phonetics. And when he said, get her done, it threw the guy off and he was looking for a D at the end uh, the whole time. So use the proper phonetics. I'm gonna do one more quick demo. I just wanna show what's possible on the higher frequencies. Uh, this one's about 168 miles. It's on 1296. At the time I was running a max of 10 watts and operating on the single 55 element uh, loop Yagi that you see on top of the uh, far back tower there. So uh, here's, here's a 1296 demo. Yeah, got the beam on you. You're coming in good and clear. I've got a very good copy on you now, so uh, really appreciate it. Uh, thanks for uh, the contact. We just got this SSB uh, transverter back from repair and uh, repaired the antennas and was in the process of testing. Okay, that was a uh, quick uh, demo of 1296, 10 watts and a single uh, 55 element antenna, uh, about 168 miles. So, you know, that was a, uh, a good contact and uh, shows, you know, even on the higher frequencies, you don't need a lot of power. Most radios come with 10 watts and that's what probably 90% of your contacts on 1296 will be running. So I don't think you need a lot of power to, uh, to have fun on that band. Uh, I have worked uh, Florida, Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina, uh, Missouri, uh, Arkansas, and multiple areas of Texas, all on 1296 with 10 watts. So you can have a lot of fun. I, uh, I hope that the, uh, the few little demos I did here helped uh, whet your appetite. Samantha, I hope I answered your questions uh, on here somewhat. One of the things that I uh, want our, our followers and uh, staff to understand, we are going to be spending a lot of time on weak signal activity and uh, what it is, how it is, how to build a station, how to make contacts, and the tools uh, to use to uh, make those contacts. There's a lot of really great tools that will help show uh, propagation, real-time uh, activity on the six meter, two meter band and uh, everything, so uh, have a lot of fun. While weak signal continues all the way up into the microwave bands, uh, our club, uh, the hamster group, we personally kind of feel that's a little bit more specialized. So we focus on weak signal from six meters through 23 centimeters and everything in between. All right, well, let's go back over to uh, the rest of the group here. Uh, Sam, I hope I answered your questions. Okay, Greg, on your on your segment, I have a question. Um, okay. So, are, are are you saying that by using SSB, somebody can talk further than they would on FM? Yeah, almost twice, uh, sometimes three times the distance uh, on single sideband uh, compared to FM. Uh, just a quick example: uh, I go to Corpus, as you're aware of. Uh, almost every uh, twice a week. And uh, what we do is uh, we go ahead and uh, going down there, I uh, am able to uh, talk on FM simplex on 146.52 with the guys back here, maybe 20 miles. Uh, on single sideband, I can talk the whole trip, 169, 170 miles on the whole drive. So, uh, wow. And that's antenna to antenna. And I wow, think that's wow, something, wow. 
I think that's something that's interesting enough, and I think it's going to have enough, garner enough attention that we should actually do a segment in the future or another segment in the future, giving a little more detail on exactly how that works out. Yeah, uh, and we're going to go into that. We'll be addressing weak signal activity. Uh, both Andrea and I are real big weak signal operators, and uh, we're going to be addressing that a lot in future episodes. Excellent. Great. Yeah, great. And we're going to get Samantha there, too. <laughs> hey, if you can get Missouri <laughs> with a weak signal, I will be impressed. <laughs> uh, I've done it. That's, that's not a problem. Yeah. <laughs> so now this week, we've got Andrea doing something with FM. So Andrea, what do you have for us this week? Yeah, thanks, Sam. Yeah, a little change of pace this week. I will am interviewing John KM for KMU. He's a relatively new ham, only about, he got his license not quite six years ago. And um, he operates the FM only category in the VHF contests and has done a lot to increase activity in his area. We did have a little bit of technical problems at the start of the interview but we got those sorted out within the first 20 seconds or so. So let's go to the interview. Hi, John. I don't know what's going on here. I'm not a cat. Let me try something here. Bitch, stop that. Today we are talking to John Young, KM4KMU, a amateur radio operator who may be crazier than me. Uh, I met John uh, back in 2016 at the VHF Super Conference outside Washington, DC. And uh, he had a crazy looking vehicle parked right next to mine. And we will get into those details. But um, First, John, I'd like to welcome you to Ham Talk. I appreciate you inviting me to be here this evening. Uh, it's been a heck of a lot of fun, and hopefully some of the stories and the, the things we say will uh, be interesting to people. I'm sure sure they will, will be. And uh, for our viewers here, John is a operator in the FM-only category during the VHF contests. John, you're, you're relatively new to the hobby. How did you, when did you get into the hobby and, and how did you do that? Well, I, I was first interested because my dad was a ham in the 60s and I grew up in the shack and was always interested in getting into it and had tried the code for many years, uh, junior high school, high school, couldn't pass it. And then eventually it went no code. Um, I didn't notice that though, because I was busy with the career and all that. Um, and then one night I stumbled across Amateur Logic TV, enjoyed it, uh, realized this is something I really needed to do. I had always wanted to get my ham license, so I studied, went to Dayton in 2015, took my exam, uh, passed it, got my technician, got my general after a lot of prodding from uh, Gordon West uh, in that same weekend, and came home and bought a little handheld HT, and like most other uh, you know, technicians, uh, fiddled around on repeaters and got bored pretty quick and was looking for something new to do. So you really started in the hobby and got into contesting very quickly. Um, that's about the same time I had started doing roving. Uh, so why did you choose the FM only category as your uh, category of entry? Well, I'd have to say because number one, I had an FM radio, a little HT or FT60, uh, you know, five watt radio. Uh, wanted to do something a little more challenging than talk on repeaters. And so when I looked into the contesting thing and I read a web article on it and it seemed like it'd be a lot of fun, uh, <clears throat> thought that maybe with a little bit of practice I could do well. And as I studied more and more, I realized that, you know, the HT and the little rubber duck was not going to get the job done. Uh, so uh, I started studying what to build. And then I realized that, you know, this was December of 2015 and there's going to be a contest in January. So I might as well put something together uh, so I could go out and, and have fun in a contest. 
And, you know, one thing led to another and uh, I ended up modifying my Jeep to get me up on a mountaintop because altitude is everything, especially in FM. Altitude certainly helps a whole lot. So if I understand correctly, the primary purpose of your vehicle is to get you up on a hilltop with your antennas in the middle of winter off road. Is that right? That is absolutely correct. The, uh, <clears throat> the January contest I thought was probably the one contest that I could do well in. The, the dominant players in FM were all up in upstate New York. And in January, they're going to have really cold temperatures, really heavy snowfall. And being down in Virginia, it doesn't get that cold. It doesn't get that snowy. Uh, and every year for the past 10 years prior to that contest, I had led groups of off-roaders up onto this 4,000-foot mountaintop in central Virginia. And I figured, hey, you know, I've been up there every year, so I'm going to build up a rig because I've, I've got a a fairly well-built rock crawling Jeep uh, with large tires, lockers, and all the, all the go fast or, or go rugged goodies that an off-roader loves. Uh, and there's no way I couldn't get onto that mountaintop in January. So uh, by having that altitude advantage, I thought I might stand a pretty good chance of beating the guys in New York. Even though I was a newbie, you know, I thought, well, you know, this might work out well. So I'll just modify the vehicle. It didn't owe me anything. It had been rolled over a number of times in the rocks and beaten up pretty bad. So I might as well just start cutting holes in it and welding stuff to it and, uh, and build it out to do some uh, radio contesting. So, like I said, viewers, there you have it. Crazy. <laughs> Crazy. I, I may have a lot of stuff in my car, but I keep it safe on the highway. I don't try to climb hills. I don't rock crawl with my rover. I don't go through snow and stuff to get up to hilltops. So, so you, you mentioned uh, going up there. How did that first contact, uh, excuse me, how, how did that first contest work out for you? Well, I never got quite to where I wanted to. Uh, two weeks before the contest, we had a four foot snowfall and I knew it was going to be hard, so I brought chains along with me uh, just to work my way down the trails. Um, and I never made it to my desired spot of flagpole knob as I was kind of working down the trail. Coming the other way were a group of off-roaders. The two lead vehicles were Suzuki Samurais on one-ton truck axles and 44-inch tires with V8 motors in them. And they weren't able to beat their way through the snow drifts to get there. And they advised me it would be a, a, a real effort and foolishness to give it a shot. Uh, and these guys had skull caps and the, the flaming skull t-shirts on. So you knew that they understood what they were doing. So uh, I trusted them and I settled for a meadow about 500 feet lower and worked the contest from there. The contest itself went really well. I talked to 80, 90 people that uh, were more than happy to make the contact, but I could only convince about 10 of them to submit log sheets. Uh, so when I finished up with my scoring, I only submitted a log with 10 people. As a newbie, I thought that your logs had to be verified uh, by the people you talk to. Well, as it turns out, that's not the case. Um, you know, all of the contacts would have counted. They be, would have been considered to be uniques. Uh, so I would be the only person that had chatted with them. Um, yeah, AWRL will check your uniques occasionally, make a couple phone calls. Um, uh, of course, I didn't know any of this at the time. So I did not submit everybody. I only submitted the 10 or 11 that agreed to send in a log. Um, ended up you know, scoring, a, you know, I think 11th or 12th place out of 20 some entries, uh, but had one whale of a good time up there. It was cold, it was windy, uh, but the people I talked to made it a huge amount of fun. Uh, and then a couple of weeks later, you and I met at the, or actually about a month later, we met at the super conference and that's where my eyes were opened up uh, and realized all the things I'd been doing wrong and how, how little I really understood about this hobby. Well, 
there is certainly a lot to learn. And, uh, you know, that was really cool that you came out to the super conference. That was my first ever VHF conference. I got invited um, because I had fall, fallen into this roving stuff and, and people said, hey, you should come out to the conference. I had a wonderful time and, and I will recommend if, if you know of a conference, a VHF conference, the individuals that you'll meet there are so helpful. So uh, well, you, you, you mentioned being, I'm going to, you mentioned being crazy. That was right after you did your like 1500 mile row from New Jersey down to Texas. Uh, Pennsylvania uh, that, to Texas. Yeah. Yeah. And you had that beautiful QSL card that showed the route. Um, so while at that point in time, uh, um, you know, you may call me crazy, but, um, you know, I, I, from that moment forward, I always looked upon you as being someone that uh, was a little bit nuttier than I am, although I guess it's mutual. <laughs> it's a different type of crazy, I suppose. <laughs> so, well, let's go take a look at that, that vehicle that, that uh, you take up onto those hilltops here. Um, okay. We've got a few pictures. So you want to tell us about this first one here? Sure. Uh, in that first, that, that first picture it is in fact my vehicle parked in the meadow where I couldn't get to reddish knob, or get to flagpole knob. Um, the snow wasn't all that deep up there. It was about six, eight inches deep, packed down. It was melting by that point. About a half mile further on is where the big drifts had happened where the snow came off the cliffside and blocked the trail. That's really cool. Before we move on to the, the next photo, I wanted to ask you, I see on there you have a two meter vertically polarized Yagi, uh, a 70 centimeter vertically polarized Yagi and a vertical there. Uh, were you just operating the two bands in that contest? That is correct. Okay, let's, let's move on to the next photo. The photo you have up right now is a picture of the vehicle sitting on a trailhead. Uh, this was September. Um, the following September after my first contest. And I'd added uh, additional bands. I'd added the, uh, the, the 220 to it um, and had uh, improved my antennas considerably. And uh, that was actually a very fun contest. I had sent out 4,000 emails asking people to get on the air, uh, all the hams in the local area. And in response to that, I had one young fella <clears throat> who built a tape measure Yagi and went to a hilltop. Uh, his mom actually wheeled him up there. He was in a wheelchair. Uh, and he built the radio, he built the Yagi specifically to make that contact with me. Probably the most memorable cue so I ever had. Ended up taking first place in that contest also. Uh, so that was an absolutely wonderful time. Well, congratulations on getting first place. And that's a a really uh, cool cool story. Uh, I do have to co comment that uh, your whole setup there looks nice and compact, which I imagine is important for going up to uh, up some of the trails. It, it, it is, in fact. Uh, there's a lot of low branches, a lot of stuff hangs down. It takes about 45 minutes to an hour to set it up, so I, I don't rove. Some people think I'm a rover, but in fact, you know, I will go to a location, set up, and operate. Yep, makes sense. Uh, let's look at the photo three. Well, now what, now what you're looking at is a view uh, of a location that I truly love, which is Reddish Knob. That is a bald knob with an asphalt pad on the top. You literally spiral around the knob to get to the top. It's 4,400 feet, uh, dead in the center of the National Radio Quiet Zone. I can run zero squelch. Um, and I have a clear field of view, basically any direction I want to work. Uh, what a fantastic location. So the question that immediately comes to mind there, being smack in the middle of the national radio quiet zone, how do you operate radio? Well, the first thing you do is you contact the Green Bank Radio Observatory and you ask permission. <clears throat> then they ask you a bunch of questions about your radio system, the antennas, your beam widths, your power levels, the frequencies you're going to operate at. They, uh, they gnaw on that for a few weeks. They send that to some other organizations. 
that uh, use the National Radio Quiet Zone. And about a month later, you either get back a go or no go from them. And I've been very fortunate that every time I've gone up there, they have eventually given me the approval to operate. But you must be a temporary station. Uh, you can't put up a fixed transmitter, uh, but you can put up a temporary transmitter. Okay, that's very interesting. I'm just curious because part of that zone, Route 81 runs through that, doesn't it? Uh, it does indeed, but you know, anyone who's driving up and down 81 uh, is temporarily in the area. And the Green Bank Radio Observatory and the other facilities that are up there are deep in bowls. Uh, they're actually shadowed pretty significantly. Where I was at, I'm actually staring right into the giant dish antennas that these facilities have. Um, and so if I'm operating on the frequency they're using and I'm running 100 watts with you know, 18 dB a gain, uh, I'm gonna you know, make waste of what they're trying to accomplish uh, with what would be phenomenally weak signal activities. All right, uh, let's uh, move on to the next image. This is a real pretty image. Yeah, that, that's Blue Knob Ski Resort. That's January of 2018. And um, I, could n I, I did eventually get permission to operate at Reddish Knob, uh, but it didn't come until three days before the contest. It was a little slow for them to get the response back. And I always have a backup site in mind and lots of rovers have used the Blue Knob Ski Resort in June and September. So I figured, well, I'll go up there in January. It's a great backup, gets me up to the Northeast, lots of ham operators. What I didn't realize when I got up there and I discovered when I got up there was that the LED floodlights, the automobile ignitions, and the ski lift motors generated like an S7, S8 noise level. Um, I worked real hard. I tried to, to make it go. Uh, I even had a handler on a separate frequency that had like 60 people queued up to talk to me. Uh, and he was passing them to me to prevent a pileup. I only heard one or two out of the 60. Um, and basically went QRT after about seven hours. Um, uh, it was, a, it was a, a, a beautiful effort by a lot of people to contact me, but I just picked the wrong spot to operate from. Yeah, I guess uh, it worked very well when it wasn't ski season, but when they turned on all that equipment for skiing, it, 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 it created a different story. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. And I see you've got now six meters and, and one and a quarter meters added to your setup there. That is correct. Uh, I, I added, now I, at that point I had all four bands, had TE amplifiers, and had also changed from the FT8800 to an FT991A, and had added a preamp uh, for 70 centimeter, which was tremendously beneficial. Uh, much better, much better system set up. But despite all that, yeah, it was absolutely crushed by noise uh, up at Blue Knob. And FM only is only those four bands, correct? That is correct. It's only those four lower bands. Uh, next image here. That one looks pretty cold, yeah. I have to say. <laughs> uh, indeed it was. That would be a backup site to, another backup site to Reddish Knob. Um, since I knew Blue Knob wouldn't work, I had found an alternate backup uh, on a place called Freeze Land Road for a January contest. Could not be more appropriate a name. Um, I went up there when I couldn't get permission. Actually, I got permission to go to Reddish, but they were expecting, uh, you know, 50 mile an hour winds and single digit temperatures in an ice storm at the same time. So I dropped down 2,000 feet and went to Freeze Land Road. Uh, and it lived up to its name. I got there in the middle of an ice storm. Move on. Well, there looks like some ice. Yeah, indeed it was. Um, I thought I'd be smart. You know, I, I, I knew that ice might happen. So I coated my antennas um, in a release agent to hopefully keep the water from sticking and ice from forming. It didn't work. Um, the ice storm was bad enough that within about three hours, uh, my Viswar shot up to three to one plus. I dropped the antennas, cleared the ice off, set them back up. In another hour, they iced up again and I was back to Viswar over three to one. Uh, and so went QRT about six, seven hours in. 
So the photo you're looking at was actually shot at a fuel station, a gas station at the bottom of the mountain um, where I had decent light. Yeah, those ice tubes are probably three eighths to a half inch thick on the wall. Um, I was really lucky I got run out of there. Um, overnight, a very large, like eight inch diameter limb broke and fell right where the Jeep was, which would have completely destroyed the antennas. Wow. But I, I find it interesting that you didn't include the Jeep and get in the getting destroyed, just the antenna. Not with the roll cage on it. No, I would have been fine inside the rig. If you know, if he can roll it over and all that, you know, who cares about an eight-inch limb? See, like I said, he's he's crazy. If you just roll the vehicle, not a no big thing. Tree on the vehicle, no big problem. No, it's all it's right. a tactic. When you're off-roading, sometimes you lay it on its side to actually climb over something. <laughs> Moving on to our next photo here. And this looks like uh, the inside. Uh, indeed it is. I, the, the vehicle's been through a couple different uh, configurations. Early on, I was facing sideways in the vehicle um, and it was very uncomfortable with no leg room. So I later uh, took the passenger seat, turned it around facing backwards, built a table across the front and then uh, remounted all my equipment and then got rid of the manual Armstrong rotor and put an electric rotor. So this is actually a much more comfortable position. And it's where I'm sitting right now. You can see the, uh, the windshield, well, you can't see the windshield, but you can see the sun visor behind me. I'm currently in the operating position, legs stretched out, very, very comfortable, much better than it used to be. The next photo. This one's uh, interesting to me because you can see that your Yaggies are not vertically oriented like in your earlier photos, but they're kind of diagonal photo. So what's in, you can tell us what the fo that photo is, but can you also explain the, the unique uh, antenna mounting there? Yeah, well, that photo was taken up at Friesland Road. And the reason for having the antennas at 45 degrees is so that I can get more grids or get more multipliers. Uh, there are a large number of large contest stations in Connecticut, New York, Southern Pennsylvania, New Jersey, uh, but they're 200 to 300 miles away. And by rotating my beams to 45 degrees, these contest stations that are horizontally polarized are able to communicate with me. Now I had to go to the effort to tune my antennas so they worked at the lower ends of the band. But uh, a lot of these contest stations are willing to switch over to FM. Uh, and that enables me to gather a lot of grids that normally would be unavailable if my antennas were vertically polarized. That sounds like a very smart I idea. And uh, last month I was talking about uh, tropospheric propagation and how um, stations operating weak signal single sideband compared to those using FM have a number of other things they stack in their favor. Higher power, larger antennas, the polarization helps a little bit. Um, and so as FM only, you can't recover that the say 10 to 12 dB advantage single sideband has, but by having good antennas and working stations that have high power and good antennas, you, you really can extend your rate reach even on FM. You absolutely can. Now, you gotta be honest, they are doing the heavy lift. They have more gain, a lot of them are stacked beams. Uh, they have the preamps on all the bands, and they've got much higher quality receivers than I do. Uh, so they are generally doing the, the heavy lift, but they, they all get a kick out of making an FM contact at 200 to 300 miles. Um, and it, it is always one of the high points of the contest to, to work those stations at such long range on FM. Yeah, I can imagine. Uh, just curiosity, um, you initially, do you sked with them to come directly on FM? Do you find them on sideband and ask them to switch to FM for, for you? I have done both. 
Um, whenever, um, whenever possible, we will set up schedules. In fact, uh, with uh, K1TEO, we actually start every contest together on FM. And we usually begin on either two meter or 220. Uh, and then we rip through the bands and then you know, we typically go off and do our separate things at that point. Uh, but it's not uncommon for me to, uh, when things slow down on FM, to get on sideband. The 991A will let me do that. Uh, and I will give out points on sideband to people on six meter, two meter, uh, 432 and 220, and then ask them to try FM. Uh, and the fact that I'm at 45 degrees polarization and my antennas will tune down to lower frequencies, they're usually willing to try that, even if they have to dial power back to you know 25 or 10 or even five watts to minimize reflected power. Uh, they're generally willing to give it a try just for the novelty of going to FM. Very nice. Okay, we've got one more photo here. Well, uh, what I can say is FM is great. Um, it is so much fun. Uh, as a new ham, learning a little bit about contesting, building a station, uh, it's been a thrill and a half, and I've spoken to so many hundreds of wonderful people. FM is a little slower, a, a tad more genteel, so we usually talk a round or two during a contact. We don't just you know, rip out the uh, the exchange. Uh, and I've had the most fun with it I could ever imagine. Hence, uh, a big thumbs up. Uh, it's just been a thrill. How have you done in the, the contests in, in, in general? How did you do this last January? Well, what, what, what things are you trying to achieve? Well, January ha has been my nemesis. Um, I built the Jeep to go out and do a January contest. And because I was a newbie, I messed it up. Uh, and then, you know, a year later, I missed winning January by less, by about 1% in score. And then I had one bad event after another where ice or snow or QRM shut me out. Uh, <clears throat> and so I keep trying and trying. I have taken first place in the September event a couple times. Uh, I do not contest in June. I'm usually supporting a multi-op station in June, W4IY. So I refer to January as being my white whale. It's the one thing that I'm always pursuing but can never quite catch. Uh, I thought I had it last year and a gentleman out of Southern California just blew my score away. Um, so try it again this year and it looks like I may have finally finally scored well enough uh, to, to win the January event and have finally harpooned my white whale. That'd be great. From what I see in the raw scores, uh, unless you made some big, big <laughs> logging gap, your 18,000 points versus the nearest competitor, which is down around 1,000 points, um, it looks like you've got it, but you know what? I feel the same same way when I have a good score. I'm like, you know, somebody's going to mess up on the other end that I work that they'll they'll have me logged as IZ or <laughs> instead of EZ or something like that. And then I'll have 40 QSOs and penalties, loss multipliers, my score will evaporate. So <laughs> it, 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 it is, in fact, possible that that could happen but uh it would be it would it would be a truly wonderful amazing story if it did um you know a, a score like that yeah part of it is because of the station i built but the majority of it is people getting up on the air five years of emailing all my previous contacts making fm fun chatting with people and letting them enjoy contesting on FM, which they never think would happen. We had activity above activity uh, this January. I didn't even need to get on the air. Uh, people were up there and calling each other and having a blast. Um, it, it, was, it was by far and away the most active and fun contest I ever had. John, there's one more thing I'd like to talk about before we uh, r wrap it up today. And, and that is, um, you mentioned sending out some emails, um, some of your, your work to get people, P, 
people on the air and and I've roved through the area and and one of the comments that I I made in my soapbox for um, the January 2020 contest seems like like a whole pandemic ago um, in that contest when I hit Northern Virginia 146.52 just like came to life um there was and, and just to set the stage in that contest there was freezing rain and snow up in pennsylvania where i started and some of the stations in that area were were getting iced up and and taken off the air um, a lot of the weak signal guys were also flipping over to ft8 so as I came down from Pennsylvania and the, the hills there and, and rolled into Maryland, uh, I hit, you know, the rain. I, I had worked it from, from some of the areas where I was in snow and ice, had to clean some off my antenna. But the whole area, just there were a whole bunch of stations on there. And it seemed to me like you've done such an excellent job um, getting people on the air, getting people excited about getting on the air and operating uh, and working as part of the contest, even though they may not be the big station. So you want to talk about that a little bit? FM can be extremely slow unless there's people that get on the air. And the easy way to do that is to simply do presentations at club meetings, uh, and then e email all your previous contacts. And over five years, uh, that list has grown to three, 400 uh, ham radio operators. And a lot of them get up on the air and they're enjoying it because they don't know what contesting is. Uh, they get on there, they have fun, it's exciting. They talk to people they've never spoken to before and they feel the energy. Uh, and that's part of what you experienced was that regional energy that was generated uh, between all these different folks and it, it is it only continues to get stronger with time one of the things you mentioned about that john was that in this past january's contest um, that there was so much activity you being there almost seems secondary is is that right uh, it absolutely was at, at, at this point in time we've got enough people getting on the air that they enjoy working each other uh and for the Frankly, for the first time, I didn't feel like I had to pull the load and keep the activity level and keep the interest up. People were excited to be making contacts on their own uh, and working folks in areas they'd never communicated with before. Simplex is unusual on FM, and when people see what it can do, they really have a heck of a lot of fun with it. Cool. That's really cool. And you did touch on something I was going to ask about. You said uh, you didn't feel you had to carry the load. So at the start of this, you, did you really have to be persistent and, and get out there and, and just understand that a lot of people weren't on, and, but because you were persistent, that helped, helped it grow? To a great extent, it was. You know, I, I would call CQ, maybe wait a minute, call CQ again. And then if nothing was happening, I would get on a repeater and invite people to come over onto Simplex. Uh, and I'd get somebody and I'd try and start a conversation. And we'd talk for 5, 10, 20, 30 minutes uh, on Simplex just to get the noise out there and pull people in that were scanning. Uh, that was totally unnecessary this last January. Um, we were just, we were stomping all over each other left and right. It was so busy. Wow. I, when I um, am roving and I'm moving through typically an urban area or things get quiet, I'll go on 5-2 and I'll make some CQs. But I always treat it a little bit differently than I do on sideband because sometimes people aren't used to hearing a CQ on 5-2. On um, and, and I, I always say, I'm, I'm just looking for people to help me get points in the contest. Um, and I'm always willing to talk, take the time to talk to people and say what I'm doing and, and be a little bit more conversational on five, two. Well, it's absolutely true. Um, 
you know, when you're when you're contesting on FM, especially on the simplex band, you know, you're you're in somebody else's turf. You're disrupting their routine. They're not used to hearing, you know, people bang out CQ contest constantly. You throw it out there. You hope somebody replies. You talk a little while. You make it fun. Uh, you go around or two. You know, you're interesting. The, the rover is interesting. What are you doing? Why are you doing it? How many bands do you have? You know, it, it, it's a great conversation starter. And the same thing with my Jeep. People ask about that and they get curious and more people get on the air. The more fun you make it, the more you're like honey uh, and less like vinegar, uh, the more activity you generate. Yeah, I, I would agree. And, and talking, other people come on and they hear, hear what you're talking about and they'll listen and then, then you say, hey, anybody else out there that can, can help me out? I try and do that often enough because um, since I'm not sitting on a big hilltop, I can run out of range of people um, if I'm not careful and get, get to yakking too much and, and stuff. Um, so what advice might you have to offer for somebody that's looking at getting active on FM or trying to generate more act, FM activity in, in their area, simplex activity? Well, the first thing is just get on the air and make noise during a contest. Uh, if you can find your way to a hilltop, even with a handheld, or especially if you have a mobile rig with 25 or 50 watts and a mag mount, uh, you might be surprised when you get, you know, 500 to 1,000 feet above the local terrain. Um, you will generate a lot more action than you think was possible just from, you know, just from your experience working at the QTH. You know, the HT range, my, my mobile rig range at home, uh, even with the beams, was 10, 15 miles. I get up to 1,000 feet. I'm going out 100 miles minimum at that point. So I'd say get a little altitude and get out there and have fun. Uh, do it for a few hours. You get tired, go home, get a good night's sleep, get a meal. Uh, but it's activity begets activity uh, and persistence really pays off. Maybe, maybe uh, if you know, you're a member of a local club or something, kind of promote the idea within the clubs and that say, hey, at this time in the contest, I'm going to be on and why don't we all get on and try and do something? And it's it like really that. makes a difference. If you, uh, if you could get 30 people up on the air from a local club or from a couple of local clubs, you stand a pretty good chance of actually getting a, a top five, uh, if, if not a, a, a top three score. It doesn't take a lot on FM. Yeah. Okay, John. Well, I'd like to thank you for coming on to Ham Talk today. It's been a great conversation we've had with you. And I'm sure our viewers will find it very informative. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. And it's been a lot of fun. You're welcome. Take care. This is Kilo 2 Echo Zulu, roving reporter for Ham Talk. All right. So now we want to take a few minutes to talk a little bit about how the weather has impacted literally all of us because with my jobs the way they are you know I got impacted as a matter of fact our mass vaccination event with the National Guard was postponed but we'll get into that in a little bit. Um, Greg why don't you give us a little bit of information about what you've been through in the last week or so since the winter storm. Well the first thing I'm going to do is tell you that you left your weather drunken in my front yard and I appreciate it <laughs> you just keeping it to yourself thank you. Uh, it actually got exciting here. We were without power. Uh, we had spotty power from 2 a.m. Sunday night, Monday morning, until uh, just past noon uh, Monday, and then we were without power. My daughter, who lives a couple houses down from us, uh, brought her and the baby down because they wanted a warmer house. Now, I want to tell you, our house is 47 degrees with the fireplace. Uh, her house mm. was 36. So uh, mm. I guess they, they did want it. Uh, but the only casualty we had was up at the ranch house where we stupidly turned all the heat and power off uh, before we left uh, two weekends ago. Uh, mm. Got down into the low single digit temperatures inside being cold and our toilet froze and exploded. 
So we went up there and the whole back of my toilet tank is only one half and it's a block of ice. And uh, I just connected the uh, toilet and carried the back tank out so that it would melt not on my hardwood floor. Mm. But uh, other than that, mm. we came out pretty mm -mm -mm. good. See, there's a That's lot good. of there's a lot of things that are happening like that right now, not only in Texas, but all over the Midwest, everywhere, actually, I think got hit pretty well. Melissa, did you experience the powder, power outage? I know right now you don't have internet. Oh, yeah, most definitely. We experienced uh, all the issues everybody else had in the area with the power loss, and uh, then our water went out. Um, we didn't end up with any frozen pipes, but eventually the water supply stopped uh, because of the supply center, where whatever the issues were there. But I, I could say that we were blessed uh, definitely through all of this because we had uh, power on, power off, on, off, on, off for several days. And uh, I mean, the worst issues we had to deal with was was uh, shutting off the water heater and then shutting off the septic sprinklers and then, you know, shutting off the electronic because the on and off is just was mm -hmm. uh, wreaks havoc on all of that stuff. And uh, we ended up with two two busted pipes so far. I have a we just recently moved here to this house. So we're not we weren't familiar with where all the cutoffs were uh, and that kind of thing. Uh, and then, you know, we have a, we own a second house in New Braunfels and I have yet to go over there to, to turn the water back on and see what's going on with that house. But uh, there were people in this, out in this area, uh, east and, you know, north, northeast of the San Antonio area that didn't, they didn't have power for, you know, 12, 16 hours at a time. Um, and, and some people were, with, were without water as of, you know, day before yesterday. So it, it was tough. And of course, everybody's pretty much kept in touch with each other for this group. And that's one thing I appreciate about you guys, because even with everything that we're juggling here, I was constantly getting an update from Greg. Every, we're fine. We're okay. And then Melissa would answer him. So I'd get an update on Melissa and how she was doing. And then Andrea, you know, so it's, one thing that I'm grateful for, for this whole T, you know, podcast or whatever you want to call it is that I know how you guys are and I, yeah. I know you're okay. Yeah. I'm going to blame Andrea for this because she was complaining <laughs> that we weren't getting any snow in Texas when she was. <laughs> well, yeah, I was missing snow. It, it well, was... Andrea, how was your last <laughs> week and a half? Been? <laughs> it, it was great having some snow. Um, yeah, it was. It was. It, it was fun. <laughs> it, it was. I, I, I have to say. It was say, beautiful. I, I, it, it was. And, and to a large extent, I took it in stride because, I mean, it was only four inches of snow. Driving on the road wasn't a big deal for me. And um, now work was closed Monday, Wednesday, and Thursday. Tuesday was mm -hmm. open. We only had like one in five people show up at work. Um, I mm -hmm. showed up in shorts and short sleeves, even though it was single digits out and described it as, <laughs> and, and described it as brisk out. Um, <laughs> even for up north, I'm a bit of a polar bear. As long as I'm moving around, I, I don't, and, and I'm not standing out. It wasn't that windy and, and it was sunny, sunny out. So <clears throat> It was kind of like, you know, I, I had to had to kind of rub it into the Texans, I guess. Well, I'm I'm going to ask you a favor, Andrea. The next time you're homesick for snow, take your butt back up to New Jersey. <laughs> That's all I'm going to ask. Yeah, because we got a little bit of that overspray over here in the Missouri too. So you honestly, <laughs> you guys can keep that mess up north anywhere else because, um, like I referenced earlier, we had the Missouri National Guard is helping with mass vaccination events out here, and we had to postpone ours. And a lot of people are angry about that because they're like, "Well, other places are doing it when it's cold and there's snow. Why aren't you?" Well, because Saturday night our vaccination event was supposed to take place on Valentine's Day on Sunday. Go figure. Um, but on Saturday night, our lows were negative 14. Oh, my. Oh, 
Yeah, so yeah, and, I think it was a good thing that they postponed that event. <laughs> yeah, I don't know how you guys are doing your shots, but like when I went and got my first one, mm -hmm. we just pull, we drive up to one tent and we go to the next tent and then the next tent and then we're on our way home. I would not want to be those poor people out there. Doing that's pretty the much why everything. That's pretty much why the decision was made was between the fact that we were going to be vaccinating the elderly, uh, you know, they're anywhere from, they considered them anywhere from, I believe, 70 to 95 or higher. Um, so can you imagine a 95 year old even sitting in a car for hours because they do when they do these in line mass vaccination events, you can be sitting in line for hours, even if you have an appointment. Um, and the idea of having them out there when it was absolutely that frigid of a temperature, it was yeah. unthinkable. So wow. bringing you back yeah. around to communications though, did any of you have the opportunity because power was out or whatever, did you use your emergency power, your emergency communications during that? Our power was out so long, we didn't have any emergency power left. <laughs> yeah. I mean, That's not good. I made a, a big, big goof, you know, most of my stuff is in the car and that was functional once the ice melted off of it, but I, I didn't mm -hmm. really have opportunity to spend out in the car and my handheld, which I have inside, I accidentally left it on after our Sunday mm -hmm. night net here and the battery was completely dead. I brought it into work Tuesday to charge it and then I forgot to bring it back and yeah. <laughs> So, so coming I, next yeah. month, we're going to be back to amateur radio emergency service section. <laughs> the next topic will be how to prepare for a winter storm. <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm sensing a lot of needs for uh, Melissa's segments. <laughs> or I mean, Samantha's segments, sorry. Yes. I'm yes. feeling like this is probably an appropriate time. <laughs> Just uh, Guys, when the bad weather's coming in, you're supposed to already be charging your batteries, making sure your generators have fuel or you have fuel for them, so on and so forth. We're literally going through all that right now because oh. of yeah. the mass yeah. Here, Here's the stupidest thing. I've got four generators. All of them were up at the ranch house. Shame Ooh. on you. <laughs> yeah, I, didn't, I did not plan this disaster out very well. Yeah. <laughs> My husband's favorite saying, what was it? Uh, your failure to prepare does not constitute an emergency on my yeah. part. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's my husband's and, favorite and saying. We were sitting here freezing our behinds off. I'm sitting here thinking, all I had to do is bring one generator back. One. Yep. And we would have yep. heat, lights, internet, <laughs> television. <laughs> you know how yep. boring it is to sit in a house freezing with no power, no, no nothing. Mm -hmm. And of course your phone dies. And I got, I got sent out to the truck to plug the cell phones in every couple hours to recharge them. Oh, you man. deserved it. I side with Ruth on that. You deserved it. <laughs> yeah. My, my oh, wife is wonderful, but she's a sissy when it comes to anything <laughs> below 80. All right. Now we're going to go to Melissa with show us your shack. Okay, show us your shack this month brings us some damaged equipment due to the crazy weather. And you'll see here on the screen, Tom K5VH experienced some damage to his six meter beam. He was thinking it would be repairable, but then even more ice completely destroyed it. And Greg N5XO you had the absolute scare of a lifetime when you checked your security cameras and saw your antennas bowed way over and you went running out there with your hair on fire. Come to find out the security camera lens was iced up making the image wavy. Oh yeah. So, I, uh, <laughs> I, I went running out in bare feet in ice and snow with just uh, a short sleeve shirt on because I happened to look up at my camera monitor for our security cameras plus <laughs> I've got cameras on the tower. Ice had distorted the image so it looked like my tower was bowing like a uh, bow and arrow and uh, 
what added to it was apparently a little bit of slack had formed in the guide wire as well. So I see the guide wire kind of moving a little bit in the wind and the tower bowed over. And I was just convinced my tower was on its way down. And I go <laughs> running out, I looked at it and it's straight as can be. And I come back in, I'm looking at the monitor and I thought, no, that's not right. I went back out again just to make sure I was right. After the third time, I decided that the camera must be having issues. <laughs> and I knew it was, I just didn't want to believe it. So, so uh, what were you thinking that you would do out there in your bare feet? With a oh, I didn't, I didn't think I was going to do anything. I just ran out to confirm if my tower was falling over on the house or, or, or what was going on. I, I just... He's going to superhero it back up into play. <laughs> Go pull on the guy wire. No. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I am just one of those people. I can handle the disaster. I just have to know. <laughs> so, you know, if I'd have run out, the tower was falling over, I'd have said, okay, the tower's falling over. It's the not yep. knowing yep. for sure that gets me. Yeah, exactly, uh, exactly. Uh, hey, we also have a couple of questions from our previous episodes, uh, some questions from Mike McDonald, and I'm going to pose this to Greg or anybody else who might want to answer, but uh, Mike McDonald asks a question here. He says, I have one of those cable prep tools, and it just destroys the hard line and shreds it up. I'm not sure what I'm doing wrong. Okay, uh, Mike, uh, that's, that's probably pretty easy. Uh, I'm gonna suspect one of two things. Uh, number one, check and see, you may need to replace the blades. Uh, if you bought that thing used, those blades usually get a beating because they're cutting into metal, remember. Uh, so if the blades are chewed up and uh, wore out, uh, they're gonna do that. Also, don't force the drill and tool, let it, pull it on in and it'll clean and give you a good cut. But uh, I, my suspicion is you're, you're putting too much pressure on it and possibly your blades need to be replaced. Okay, and we have another, one more question from Mike McDonald. I'm gonna pose this to Andrea. And he says, I have no idea there were such high power amps for VHF. Can you give me an idea when you use a standard radio, no amplifiers, the distance you can talk compared to when you kick on the TE systems and then the Beco amp? Well, uh, good question. You know, when I first got involved in weak signal, I did not realize how many people were running kilowatts on, uh, on, on two meters and, and higher bands. Uh, the big thing it gets you compared to say your base 100 watts, uh, a lot of the, the radios now have, is about 10 dB uh, or so, which is about equal to the difference between FM and single sideband. And so it helps, having more power helps at all the distances, but really when you start to stretch it out beyond 200 miles, 250 miles, it's really nice to have that, that extra dB, the kilowatts. I, last month I talked about the common volume of, of air that you're aiming for in uh, tropospheric propagation. Well, it's a little bit more complex than that because that air or volume that scatters the, the RF also scatters some of it into other air, which then scatters again. And uh, the more power you run, the more signal that can make it to the end. So certainly getting out to that 300 mile, 350 mile mark, a kilowatt will make a significant difference over just having 100 watts. Um, the, the large brick amps like the TE amps will get you part way there and, and help out. Um, and leave you someplace in the middle. Yeah, and a good, good example of that is uh, when we were doing my video there uh, on my segment when I was answering uh, Samantha's questions on weak signal. Uh, if you notice, uh, Tom and uh, 
the station and I'm drawing a blank on his uh, call sign right this second in Missouri, when they were talking, Tom was only running 50 watts. Now I had no problem here in either one of the stations because Tom was close to me and the Missouri station was running a KW of power. And I also was running a KW of power. We had a fantastic copy on each other. It was uh, like we were in this within a couple miles of each other. Tom had to keep repeating over and over and over uh, because he was barely being readable, but he had 50 watts of power compared to a thousand watts of power uh, plus the antenna. So uh, antenna, feed line and power all come to together to, uh, to really solve a, a good problem like that. So that's something that you want to, uh, if you can afford a little bit more power, do it. Yeah. Well, that, that, that's all the questions I have for this, uh, for this month because of our technical difficulties and issues with my uh, emails and so forth. Well, I'm kind of enjoying you as a phone this week. <laughs> this is why he's relegated to getting picked on <laughs> right here. <laughs> because I'm an optimist. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> Well, everybody, we want to thank you from the bottom of our hearts. We know that we are just, just a bunch of people getting together and putting this up on YouTube for you guys. But we really want to thank you for joining us every month. We try and have fun with it, and we really want you to as well. Thank you to the Hamsters Week Signal Group, our sponsors. They are amazing. And if you ever have any questions, of course, you can direct them to Greg. He'll drop all of the information down in the description box below. So feel free to send pictures of your shack for Melissa to use. You can feel free to send questions for Greg and Andrea for their sections. And I handle a lot of the club information, special events, and the emergency service, amateur radio emergency service. So if you have questions for us, submit them because, hey, we'll call you out. Make sure you include your name and your call sign because we want to know we're talking to fellow.